would be reduced. Um, so I want to ask two questions. One is, um, I, I just want to ask Naki one, um, one more question because you referred to it in your introductory remarks. To the, you talked about the security of demand. To the extent that the world gets more energy efficient in the consumption of, 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 of everything, including oil, what does that do to the viability of, of, of the Middle East as a supplier? Um, and then after Naki, I want to ask Pierre, I know you feel very strongly about, about the importance of efficiency. Um, why do you think it's not happening to a greater extent than it is happening? Naki, let's just have a quick answer to the question of the effect on the Middle East. Thank you very much again. And uh, for regarding the energy efficiency itself, uh, uh, we in our countries are doing our uh, uh, best just to make that kind of, uh, of uh, energy efficiency. And uh, for example, there are uh, some replacement for the public transportation uh, uh, making some metros and some uh, internal uh, uh, trains, so just to 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 to, to keep the uh, the trans uh, uh, transportation sector just uh, uh, not to use uh, very huge big uh, cars or uh, those vehicles which uh, produce uh, emissions. So, so that's one of and also. Uh, in, in some countries, their intention to go to the renewables, such as in Master, uh, you have heard about Master in the UAE. In, Master, in, yes. Yes, and in, in Abu Dhabi and in Saudi Arabia, there is a big project for solar energy, and also in Kuwait, there is a, a, an intention to go for the solar and geothermal in some Arab uh, countries, as you know. in. In, in Morocco here and, 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 and some other countries. So, so your, your point is that the oil exporting countries are increasingly embracing the notion of efficiency in renewables, so the, even, uh, even domestically. That's right. Excellent. Exactly. Thanks. Pierre? Thank you. Just, just talk about sort of energy efficiency. And again, um, given that essentially every study that looks at this says that this is the no-brainer economically, why isn't it happening? As uh, everybody mentioned, we, we are all convinced that the <coughs> energy consumption will increase in, in, in the long term because we need more energy to, for, for development. So uh, tackling the three ch challenges require all kind of energies, well, maybe we will come back, oil, gas, coal, uh, nuclear, renewable, but energy efficiency should and is clearly on the top of the list. But energy efficiency is not a low-hanging fruit. It's not cheap. It's like renewable. It requires investment with long-term re uh, return. So we, for investing in energy efficiency, like uh, renewable, we, we need a signal to show that uh, the, the, the investment will be profitable in the long term and that re in every country requires government policies. There is no development of renewable and energy efficiency without, without government policies. But it's not enough. There are two other requirements. First, the government policies has to be wise and stable because we are in a long-term industry which requires long-term commitment. So, and governments uh, are, in many countries, not comfortable with long-term commitments in, in some countries. And uh, the, the other thing I want to say is that uh, we are in an industry which requires a huge uh, amount of, of uh, financing, and this uh, requires, uh, uh, of course, uh, commitment and uh, I think a kind of harmonization of the, of the policies in the world because <clears throat> there can be policies which are incompatible with other policies. We are uh, facing that in Europe. For example, with regard to uh, a, a renewable, if you develop renewable but without developing at the same time the transmission line, uh, it does not work. So we need wise energy policies and some kind of harmonization or uh, uh, 
I would say, convergence of uh, some issues with regard to government policies. I think, but we, I would like to make a comment, we come back maybe later on shell gas, but it's obvious that all countries will not have the same policy because they have a completely different set of environment. But even, and uh, uh, Taki uh, mentioned that, even producing countries need this kind of long-term commitment because they must invest for developing their, their production, but they also develop uh, initiative for energy efficiency and for renewable because they have also need for long-term commitment. And I think there is an opportunity for some kind of harmonization of some key uh, elements. And among the key elements, I think, are safety and environmental issues because it requires an harmonization. We, th there are some issues which can only be global. Thank you. I, I want to make, I was in derelict, I, I forgot to announce this earlier, and I just want to be clear. Um, uh, Mr. Merkan, the Minister of Energy and Natural Resources from Turkey, who was billed as being on this panel, will be here later today. His schedule didn't allow him to be here in the morning, but will be here today, and so we'll be back up here for, for a bit of time this afternoon to have the discussion with the Minister from Turkey. Um, I want to pick up, uh, I want to bring uh, Carmen and, um, and Ahmed into the discussion, and I want to do that by picking up on a point that Pierre just made, which was about the need for certainty in policies, which I think is, um, and, and for intelligent policies. And I want to ask that in the context of renewable energy. Um, it seems to me that um, renewable energies, currently renewable technologies are sort of like teenagers. They've grown up quite a lot in the past few years. Um, there's a big question about the extent to which they will grow even more. And what I think we're seeing around the country in Europe and in the United States and in China are kind of growing pains of these technologies. And um, one question I have, and I think there's a general sense on the part of governments, and this is clearly happening in Spain. Um, it's also happening in Germany and to a great extent happening in, in the United States. Um, a reassessment of the intelligence of policies, of the efficiency of policies with regard to renewables. I think a general sense that the initial swipe of technologies didn't maximize bang for the buck as much as they might have, or at least that's the feeling on the part of a lot of the public. And, and that raises a question about what these policies are going to be going forward. And, and I think there's a general sense that the era of government spending on renewables at the level that it has occurred thus far in much of the world is over. And, it, and government spending is going to be much less generous going forward. So with that as a long preamble, my question is, um, how efficient or inefficient do you think policies thus far to promote remote renewables have been? And, and how do you see those policies changing uh, over time? How should they change? And then apart from how should they change, what are your realistic political antenna tell you about how they will change? Please, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, well, probably, probably renewable sector has been something like a teenager for the last uh, few years. Uh, what is true is that today, for instance, wind or PV solar uh, are two technologies mature enough to, to ensure to ensure a nice price and to ensure availability and to ensure uh, a, a supply of energy. Uh, there are another technologies just developing. Uh, anyway, there are two different policies just to support. One policy just to develop renewables inside the energy system and R&D policies committed, R&D policies to ensure that some technologies can go ahead and can, de can be developed enough to, to, uh, to give us new answers. Uh, so R&D is one policy which has to be to take in, into account uh, if we are talking about renewables. And then we have some technologies just to be in place uh, today and during the next 15 years so, without any problem. So the distinction but is between deploying certain technologies and doing research and development to bring down the cost of potentially future technologies. Yeah, yeah. this is one of the key issues. But uh, let, me, let me point out uh, one, one aspect. We have been developing, uh, let me use the example of uh, Europe. I think uh, Europe can be analyzed today as a business case, nearly as a business case. 
talking about renewables. Uh, there are a lot of mistakes. There are uh, quite a nice uh, decisions. So at the end of the day, we have a picture with, uh, with uh, quite an important amount of renewables in the mix of energy in some countries as uh, Germany, Spain, but also France or Italy. Uh, but uh, people just re-asking uh, or, or wondering if, if the policy, if this policy has made sense. We have developed a study trying to analyze which is the macroeconomic impact of this kind of policies of the developing of uh, renewables. And uh, let me just uh, highlight a couple of figures. From one macroeconomic point of view, if we, uh, we have analyzed wind and uh, combined cycle megawatt hour. Wind, the leverage cost of energy is around 81, 81 euros megawatt hour. Leverage cost. Let me just interrupt you, just because everyone in here may not be an energy uh, an energy insider. Let's just define levelized cost of electricity. That's essentially the cost over the investment cost over the long term of both building and operating the facility. And it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a metric that's widely used to compare the economics of various sources of energy, renewables against each other and against fossil fuels. Sorry. So we have to compare. We are saying always well. Uh, renewables are expensive or uh, it is a good alternative? In fact, today when we are all of us, especially in Europe, concerned with the crisis, which is, which is the, the, the answer of this question? Then comparing wind, which uh, it is uh, supposed to be the technology the most effective uh, in renewables, compare with the most effective energy power energy coming from fossil fuels, which is combined cycle today, the conclusion if, is if uh, for countries which are not producers, for instance, in Europe, uh, 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 Germany, France, Italy, or Spain, from a macroeconomic point of view, it's quite clear that wind is the best alternative uh, for, for, for any. You know, levelize, this levelized cost, 81 for wind, around uh, 65, 70 euros megawatt hour for combined cycle. Uh, if we analyze in GDP, 56 of these 81 stay in the internal GDP in Spain or in France. When we uh, are talking about wind, no more than 16, one six stay from this 65, 70 uh, euros megawatt hour in combined cycle, only 16 stay in the internal GDP when one uh, Spanish, French, or Italian people pay the electricity. If we are talking about job creation, unemployment is now one of the most uh, tricky issues in the internal policy, Around 15, 15 jobs are created from each uh, million euros invested in wind. Around six are created if we are talking about combined cycle. And just the latest, uh, the latest uh, figure, if we talk about the taxation, the uh, tax return for governments, for states, in France, let me use France because it, it is particularly amazing, from each euro around the wind, uh, the wind uh, energy and the wind industry, 55 cents goes to the uh, taxes, goes to the state. Uh, if we are talking about combined cycle, from one euro, no more than uh, around 20 is going back to the state. So, so when we are talking about renewables and when we are talking about if it is very expensive or not, if it is feasible for our power systems, I think today in the economic systems we have to have a holistic view taking into consideration all these issues and GDP and all these macroeconomic uh, 
uh, elements. So, so thank you. Pierre is about to jump out of his chair wanting to respond, but we're going to wait. No, 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 no. We're going to wait one second. Um, and I want to bring Ahmed in. And here's the, here's the way I want to focus the question on renewables. I want to have you pick up on something that um, Carmen said, um, or at least something that I asked. And that is, my impression is that Morocco it, intends to enter into the renewables market in quite a large way very soon. And obviously, that's what your company's engaged in. However, Morocco has as a backdrop, as it begins to enter into renewables in a big way, the experience of some of the first movers, the earlier movers elsewhere in the world. Spain, Italy, Germany, perhaps the United States to a, uh, to a smaller degree maybe. Um, and I wonder, if the, what lessons do you learn about how Morocco should go about raising the portion of renewable energy from what you see Spain or Italy or Germany or the United States or China having done wrong? How, how, what did they do that you don't want to do? What, how, how can you do it better? Oui. Ben, si vous voulez, pendant très longtemps, euh, pour nous Marocains, l'expérience espagnole était un modèle. Dire, on était admiratif. Et moi, je pense que, pour répondre à votre question, aujourd'hui, la crise, euh, aujourd'hui, l'industrie des énergies renouvelables, que ce soit de l'éolien ou le solaire, est en crise au niveau mondial, si on, accepte, si on fait exception de la Chine. Et la, la raison est très simple, c'est qu'un euh, certain nombre de pays européens, notamment l'Espagne et l'Allemagne, ont revu leur politique de soutien aux énergies renouvelables. Euh, plus le solaire que l'éolien. Euh, nous au Maroc, si vous voulez, nous n'avons, euh, je dirais que, on n'a pas opté pour une politique euh, identique à celle qui était adoptée en Europe, puisque euh, il n'y a jamais eu de feed-in tarif. C'est-à-dire, il n'y a jamais eu l'État à refuser le principe de fixer un tarif d'achat de ces énergies par, par un texte de loi et de libéraliser la La, la production de ces énergies renouvelables parce que ça suppose que le gap entre le tarif garanti par la loi et le tarif payé par le consommateur doit être subventionné par, euh, par l'État. C'est le cas en Espagne aujourd'hui. Donc, euh, euh, pour nous, les énergies renouvelables, enfin, moi je parle de l'éolien, le solaire, ça peut être un peu différent. L'éolien aujourd'hui, il doit être compétitif par rapport aux énergies conventionnelles. Bon, euh, même si nous avons des sites éoliens de très bonne qualité, probablement meilleurs que ce qu'on peut trouver dans certains pays européens, euh, le, le, si vous voulez, la compétitivité de l'éolien reste quand même... Bon, je voulais quand même dire une chose, c'est que cette crise de l'industrie euh, au niveau mondial a eu, a, a eu un effet bénéfique pour nous, les pays du Sud, c'est que le, le coût d'investissement a baissé. Le prix du kilowatt installé en éolien ou euh, en solaire a baissé pendant ces cinq dernières années, ce qui rend un peu l'exercice, le, je dirais, plus jouable. N'empêche que, comme j'ai dit tout à l'heure, aujourd'hui, quand vous faites votre business model et vous dites « Est-ce que je peux investir en marque dans l'énergie renouvelable ?» avec un prix compétitif avec euh, les énergies conventionnelles, eh bien... Euh, Si vous intégrez ou pas les crédits carbone, le, le gaz n'est pas le même. C'est pour ça que j'ai dit que je regrette quand même que ce mécanisme de ce, ce mécanisme de développement propre qui aidait ces projets à se faire aujourd'hui soit abandonné. C'est ce que je veux dire que les pays du Nord ne se rendent pas compte de l'erreur qu'ils sont, qu sont en train de commettre en abandonnant le soutien aux énergies renouvelables dans les pays du Sud, honnêtement, par rapport à cet enjeu de réchauffement climatique. Donc pour conclure, euh, nous n'avons pas suivi le chemin de l'Espagne, puisqu'on n'a pas voulu mettre en place un fini tarif. Aujourd'hui, les projets doivent, doivent être euh, compétitifs. Il n'y a pas de subvention de l'État pour l'éolien au Maroc, du tout. Et donc les projets doivent être compétitifs par rapport aux conventionnels. So, so let, me, let me just follow up, that's extraordinary. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Too many, too many electronic instruments up here. Um, I, I was just saying that's extraordinary. Um, and I wonder, 
how does Morocco propose to be able to attract companies to do large-scale renewable energy investment with no subsidy if apparently other countries around the world have felt it necessary to, impose, to, to offer subsidies to attract that kind of investment? Is it, simply, is it simply that Morocco was doing it in 2012 and benefiting from the price drop that has been implemented, that, that's been uh, produced by Spain's investment, by Spanish ratepayers and German ratepayers' investment? Or, or is, is, is Morocco just realizing that other countries overpaid and Morocco is not going to make that mistake? En fait, il y, a deux, il y a deux manières d'investir au Maroc pour un investisseur privé. Soit euh, répondre euh, à des appels d'offres. Donc en fait, euh, l'État les, les, ou les, agents, les, les, les établissements publics comme Mazen ou l'ONE lancent des appels d'offres internationaux, mettent en compétition les opérateurs et le prix du kilowattheure est le résultat de l'appel d'offres. N'est-ce pas Mais il n'y a pas de fin de tarif. Et à ce moment-là, euh, c'est des contrats sur 20 ans ou 30 ans, selon le cas. Et, et, et l'investisseur le, le, privé, il est ré rétribué auprès du kilowattheure qui, qui a été le résultat de, de la compétition. Et comme je vous ai dit, selon les cas, il y a ou il n'y a pas de subvention. D'accord D'accord. Mais, mais il n'y a, y a, y a, y a pas de subvention, si vous voulez, euh, euh, direct. Il y a une deuxième manière d'investir au Maroc, c'est dans le cadre de la loi 1309, n'est-ce pas qui a totalement libéralisé le, la production énergétique euh, renouvelable. Et là, effectivement, euh, l'investisseur euh, privé, qu'il soit national ou international, doit pouvoir euh, euh, trouver des clients industriels qui achèteraient l'électricité produite par les énergies renouvelables, mais sans aucune subvention de l'État. Voilà. Donc, pour, en gros, si vous voulez, pour l'éolien... L'État n'a pas besoin de subventionner. Pour le solaire, là, euh, les 160 MW qui viennent d'être attribués par Mazen à Warzezet, bah, c'est clair qu'il y a un gap entre le prix du contrat et le prix client qui, lui, va être subventionné. Decide to promote renewables has to take into account that one wind farm can guarantee nearly 20 years of price. So, is that competitive? Which are we comparing today with the price of today for 10 years later? This is one point. Another point, we let are just talking be, let about. Let me just be clear the, the point that you're making is that Morocco is entering at a later time. Therefore, entering at a time when the when the capital investments are relatively lower because of the benefit of the the, the, the reduction in cost that Spain has helped pay for or other countries have helped pay for. It. Yeah, but yeah. but uh, you invest once, and then you have to recover in 20 years. You can assure, you can ensure the price for 20 years, yeah, yeah, yeah. but the price cannot be uh, uh, the volatility of the fossil fuels cannot be assumed from for. I understand. Certainly, a price for renewables. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't know if the discussion is fit in tariff. What, I, what we know is that any financial institution, any, uh, it is not bankable an investment if we are open to the volatility of a pool where the price is fixed by uh, one fossil fuel changing the price every year with different conditions. So I don't know if it is feeding tariff. I don't know if it is a PPA warranting uh, the long-term price. But uh, if there is no a solution bankable, there is no solution. Okay, we have clearly entered a subject here that has provoked some, some significant interest among our panelists. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to let Pierre respond. I'm going to let Ahmed uh, make a, a comment. And Naki, if you'd like to jump in, please feel free. But I'm going to be really strict about this. We're going to spend about five more minutes on this subject. And if you guys talk too long and prevent the other people from talking, five minutes is it. And then we're going to move on to something else so we can cover some other subjects. Uh, so Pierre, please. Uh, I just want to react uh, and make some comments because uh, renewable is clearly on the top of the agenda at the World Energy Council. And it's obviously the energy that will be the fastest growing energy in the coming year. Fastest growing. 
I just want to make a comment, and I'm surprised. The most important renewable energy today has not been mentioned this morning. It's hydro. The largest share of renewable today is hydro, and there is a huge potential here in Africa. There is still a huge potential for hydropower. I just want to mention that. Second, uh, on, with regard to the uh, cost of renewable, I would like to make two comments. First, obviously, for example, solar energy is much more profitable on the Mediterranean uh, Sea than in the north of Europe. Just, I was involved in the uh, energy sector and I was surprised, uh, uh, I asked to my, the chairman or the CEO of the subsidiary in charge of renewable, and he said, we must develop uh, solar in Germany. And I say, I'm surprised. There is a lot of sun in Germany? No, but there is a lot of subsidies. Just to, to, make, a comment, to make a figure, here in, on the Mediterranean, including Morocco, the number of hours during which uh, solar cell can work is about 3,000, more than 3,000. In Northern Europe, it's less than half. It's 1,000, which means that for the same investment, for the same price, it's twice as much expensive to build a solar plant in Northern Europe than in Medi Mediterranean. And I wanted to, to show that it's obvious that in Morocco and in Mediterranean, there's a huge opportunity, much more than in the north of Europe. Let, let, let me just say that uh, we, we, for those of you who want to hear more about renewable energy, uh, and, and that includes me, um, we're going to spend two hours discussing the topic after this session and in, in a later session. Uh, and, and one of the things and, that we'll get into is, is the competitiveness of development of renewable energy in the South. Um, so we will dig deep, deeply into that for those of you who are interested. Who wanted to uh, talk next? Uh, Ahmed, please. Oui, merci. Oui, je voudrais juste rejoindre ce que Carmen. C'est vrai qu'aujourd'hui, le, le Maroc opte pour des PPA, des contrats sur 20 ans. Et, et c'est vrai que sur 20 ans, tout dépend de la volatilité du, du prix du, des combustibles, notamment du pétrole. Et pour euh, prendre l'exemple du, 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 du solaire, bon, aujourd'hui, c'est une information qui est publique. L'appel le, 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 d'offres de. Le premier appel d'offres de, de Warzezet, on sort avec un prix du kilowattheure de 1 dirham 62. Or, 1 dirham 62 aujourd'hui. Si vous le comparez par rapport au prix du fuel, au prix du baril d'aujourd'hui, il n'y a pratiquement pas de subvention. Donc en fait, tout dépend, c'est vrai, tout dépend de la volatilité du prix du, 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 du pétrole. Tout le monde sait qu'aujourd'hui, les prévisions sur les prix du pétrole, sur les 20 années à venir, c'est des prévisions... Enfin, tout le monde prévoit une augmentation du prix du baril. Donc sur un contrat de 20 ans, vous avez un prix qui est fixe, enfin qui est, qui est déjà décidé. Et donc, quelque part, ça vous protège contre une volatilité du prix du, des prix des, 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 des combustibles. Voilà. Donc, en fait, euh, même, même cette subvention, elle, 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 elle est variable dans le temps et elle peut être positive comme elle peut être négative sur les 20 ans. Merci. Merci, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Merci, Juste regarde, très, très brièvement. As we know that uh, although uh, the renewables are representing about 10% of the total energy con con consumed or produced uh, for the time being, but we believe and also there's a, a great effort in our countries to use uh, renewables including uh, nuclear. And, uh, but of course we believe, we believe that high, uh, the, the renewables are uh, a, a complement to the current energy kind of energy. It is not a, a, an alternative or, or, or replacing. Uh, for that reason, the terminology of alternative source of energy is not, uh, we are not in favor of that alternative. There is nothing to, uh, to, to, to uh, replace oil and gas and others, but of course to renew, to, to produce another kind of energy just to be complement to other kind of fossil fuels such as oil and gas and of course uh, coal or others. That's what I wanted to say just to, to stress on that. 
there is uh, the, uh, no alternative but, but new and renewable energy, and that is just complement to other kind of energy. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to make sure that we address a couple of more topics. We're, we have about uh, 15 minutes, perhaps more, and I do. Um, do me a favor. Just Does anyone want to ask a question? Raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. I want to just see if we have an appetite for it. Excellent. Okay, so we'll keep this short here. We'll do one or two more things, and then we'll let open up to you um, with your indulgence. Um, I want to talk about, make sure we talk about two other subjects here quickly. One is nuclear, and one is climate change, because this has been referred to by everyone up here. And I want to ask Pierre to address nuclear energy. Um, you know, in the wake of Fukushima in Japan, um, there's been a very well-publicized retrenchment from nuclear energy, particularly in Japan and Germany, and to a, to a, to a slight extent in France. Um, uh, and, um, and yet, um, uh, I think Pierre will tell you that um, he believes that nuclear energy is alive and well globally, perhaps just in different places. So, so do you want to address this topic? I mean, China is a particularly example, an interesting example here. Uh, in last March, uh, we made the study within the World Energy Council uh, asking all our members, 100 of the members, to describe what was the situation with regard to the energy uh, production and the role of nuclear in their portfolio. And the, 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 we published a report and the findings were surprising. I was, I was surprised myself. First, uh, the number of plants under construction in the world is, after Fukushima, nearly the same as the one before. There are two days, today, there are about 60 nuclear plants under construction in the world. 60. But, or at the same time, these plants are developed in countries where there was no nuclear before. Which means that the existing countries which produce nuclear do not develop nuclear. The nuclear development is in new producers. And today, there are 60 countries in the world which are either producing through nuclear or planning to develop new nuclear plants. And the 60 new nuclear plants under development are mainly in Asia and Middle East and Russia a little bit. In Europe, there is only two, and in the United States, also. So today and in the future, the development is, it's not a, a prospect, today the development is in the countries which uh, did not produce through nuclear. That's the facts. With regard to the long-term view, and we exchanged this morning at the breakfast, I, I think if you look at the very long term, 2035, which was the, uh, the IEA uh, projection, or 2050, which is the, the, the kind of perspective we are trying to tackle within the World Energy Council. Clearly, as you mentioned, fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal, will contribute the, for the great majority of energy needs in the coming century. We know that. You mentioned, I think, 75 percent in 2035. We, it's clearly, even in 2050, we need fossil fuels uh, because we cannot m shift uh, rapidly in industry, which is so capital intensive and where the commitment is so long term. And at the same time, if we want to tackle the issue of global warming, we must reduce CO2 emission. So what are the means to reduce CO2 emission in the energy portfolio? There are only two. One is to reduce energy consumption, which is the issue of energy efficiency. We mentioned that. Or to develop energies which do not produce CO2 or to capture CO2 which has been produced uh, through fossil fuels. Carbon capture is a real issue, which is technology not profitable, not competitive today, but maybe and should be in the long-term future. But in the coming 50 years or 30 years, what are the main contributions to reduce CO2 emission? I will give you the three main uh, blocks, which are of the same magnitude in the coming years. One is hydro. Hydro is a very important energy, and I <laughs> insist that there is still a potential for hydro development. 
new renewable, which will grow very fast in the coming years. But with, with, even with that growth, it will contribute only for the same kind of magnitude as hydro and nuclear. In, in, the, in the half century which comes, the three main contributors to reduce CO2 emission will be hydro, new renewable, and nuclear. And of course, one day when it will be competitive, carbon capture. Thank you. You know, here's what I'm going to do, actually, because I really do want to make sure that we have time for questions out here. I'm going to, I'm going to assume that someone in the audience is going to ask a question bearing on climate change, and I'm not going to ask the question from up here. So let me just see. Um, and and uh, Okay, let's just do right here first, please. And if, if you could please just identify yourself. Thanks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Ismi Idris Sharqawi Samuni, Fa'il Elami. ومهتم بالتواصل اولا اشكر الضيوف الكرام في بلدهم الثاني الا وهو المغرب فسؤالي موجه الى السيد احمد خاصه في قاعده عالميه تقول يجب معرفه المنتوج قبل تسويقه هذه من ضمن خمسه القواعد العالميه هل فعلا ان المغرب قام باستراتيجيه ميدانيه بالاضافه شركاء اخرين كالمانيا وكفرنسا وكاسبانيا هل اخذ العبره منهم بالاضافه اعود الى ما قاله الرئيس هذه الجلسه في بعض الحكومات اللي تخاف من هذا المنتوج فهل هناك اشراك حقيقي لهذه الحكومه المغربيه وما رايها في هذا المنتوج وشكرا فأنا شخصيا أتكلم كممثل قطاع خاص إذا ما نتكلمش على باسم الحكومة لكن ما يمكن أن أقول هو أن المغرب أخذ العبرة من تجارب دول أوروبية كما قلت كاين جوج هناك طريقتين لتنمية الطاقة المتجددة في 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 العالم هناك يعني طريقات تحديد سعر لقانوني لشراء طاقة هذا ما جرى في إسبانيا مثلا في إسبانيا كان هناك القانون حدد ثمن لشراء طاقة متجددة عبر الرياح ولا عبر الطاقة الشمسية وكان تطور كبير لهذه الطاقة في إسبانيا لكن الآن يعني الميزانية المطلوبة من الحكومة الإسبانية لدعم هذه الطاقة يعني أصبحت كبيرة جدا المغرب تجنب هذا هذا المشكل وكما قلت لك الآن الطاقة المجددة في المغرب لازم تكون يعني عندنا تكلفة من نفس التكلفة كالطاقة يعني الكونفونسيونيل إذا لا مارج دو سوفونسيون إي كازيمون نول دونك لو ماروك نيبا دون اون لوجيك دو سوفونسيون لي زيرجي رينوفابل لو ماروك دون اون لوجيك دو ديفلوبي اون بارتناريا اوجوردي ماروك ديفلوب لي زيرجي رينوفابل اون بارتناريا افيك زونتربريز كي فيان دو سي بيي لا مي إل لو في دون اون لوجيك دو افيك اون اوبجيكتيف دو مينيموم دو سوفونسيون إي كوم جو فوزي ليوليان باغ إكزومبل اوجوردي ليوليان أو ماروك il y a deux manières d'investir au Maroc. Soit il y a des appels d'offres qui mettent en compétition les opérateurs internationaux pour avoir le meilleur prix du marché à un instant donné. Et ça se traduit par des contrats sur 20 ans avec un prix défini par la compétition. N'est-ce pas Soit aujourd'hui, la loi 1309 a autorisé les investisseurs privés nationaux et internationaux à investir directement et à vendre directement l'énergie aux clients industriels qui le souhaitent. Et l'État ne subventionne pas. On ne peut pas dire que le, Maroc, le, le, que le Maroc n'a pas fait le bilan des expériences des pays, on va dire, les plus. Les Nahtaf Europa, Matalan, mais je suis dit que les Nahtaf Europa, Espagne ou Allemagne. Ahmed, 
I, forgive me. I just want to, because I, I think we addressed a little bit of this earlier. So I just want to, I, I, in my in my third electronic device, I've just been told that okay, we have no about problem. three or four minutes left, and I want to, I'm actually going to take prerogative from up here, so forgive me, and I, I want to make sure that we address climate change, and I want to ask Carmen and Naki particularly, um, because both of you referred to this, and, 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 and here's, thank you very much, Ahmed. I, okay. um, uh, the, the, the question I want to ask is this. I think that it's fairly incontrovertible that there is not going to be any global agreement on climate change anytime soon. I've run into a number of people just this morning who have traded war stories about having been at COPS, uh, and, 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 um, and, and none of those COPS, at least thus far, have produced a kind of grand global agreement on climate change. So my question is, in the absence of a grand global agreement on climate change, what do you see happening in terms of, um, of, of policy on, on, on climate? Um, and, and, and the particular question I have for each of you is, to the extent that there's uncertainty about what that means, how do you manage that uncertainty about how the world will deal with climate change in your, in your decisions about what to produce? Carmen, let's start with you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, well, first of all, um, in a couple of weeks, uh, the COP is going to be again no. right. working, Another one. In, working in Doha. Yep. Um, I think there are three elements we have to be positive. So let's see if uh, there is some nice conclusions about how to close a second part of Kyoto Protocol. Let's see if really in Doha it is possible to, to close the commitment to the commitment to have a commitment in 2015 for all the countries to have a commitment in 2020. You know, it, it is a bit tricky just to explain this way. We are going to go to Doha to see if we can reach a commitment, to reach a commitment in 15, uh, to have a commitment put in place in 20. But anyway, I think the effort is there. But more than that, which is a very diplomatic aspect, I think there are two practical issues. One important is what is, happen, what is going to happen with the uh, uh, CDM uh, scheme, with the Clean Development Mechanism scheme? Uh, for instance, uh, my company has invested in several countries considering the price of the CO2 in the international market. Let me just interrupt just again, again to define terms here. The Clean Development Mechanism is a mechanism under the United Nations uh, policies for, for dealing with climate change whereby what are construed as um, industrializing countries can, um, can sell carbon credits uh, to, um, to companies or governments from developed countries and it's led to an international trade in this. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Thanks. Sorry. The point is that uh, five years ago we were considering that uh, CO2 price, it would be around 11 uh, euros per ton of CO2. Today we are paying 1.5 euro, around 1.5 euro. So, you know, the investment, uh, the investment deal, it has been broken. Even with that, uh, we have to consider that, as Ahmed mentioned, it would be necessary to establish a mechanism just to ensure that uh, if we want to control the CO2 emissions, we need something to ensure that investment can be done taking into consideration the price of CO2. So uh, I don't know if CDM is going to go ahead in the short future. This green found uh, based today in Seoul and, and which has to be fed by, by different countries, I think is one of the keys. People start talking about NAMAS. NAMAS, at the end of the day, is just a mechanism for some countries to establish a nice planification, a commitment of development of their own uh, energy systems. And I think this is not a, a question, uh, this is a question which can be managed one by one by each country. And uh, today I think it's only Chile, the country who has uh, taken into account uh, this, this uh, option. Uh, probably it could be a nice uh, way for Morocco as well to, to be 
uh, to establish a framework to develop renewables in Thank the future. You. Thanks very much. Naki, I'm going to give you the last word and a, a short last word um, because I've been told that we have to end very soon, but please. Thank you very much. Just regarding uh, the, the climate change issues, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, that I, uh, I have a uh, long experience with the negotiations within the uh, climate change negotiation, uh, uh, UNFCCCs. And since COP1 in Berlin, which was held in Berlin in Germany, until now, until the last one, and uh, we cannot see any uh, uh, real or uh, uh, real mo movement towards the, what will uh, be a, a, in accordance with the Kyoto Protocol. Still. Kyoto Protocol, as you know, started in uh, uh, 2008, and, and it, it, it was supposed to finish uh, 2012. But of course, there is a great uh, intention to uh, extend that uh, uh, that process, but what we can see that uh, uh, during the negotiations until now there is different ideas between different uh, uh, groups, such as the uh, EU or the uh, uh, American and and, and, and and its allies, and also the. Uh, we, as all exporting countries, also we have our, our views that, as I said, this implementation of the Kyoto Protocol or, or UNFCCC should not affect the, uh, the, uh, the real economy of our countries because we, as uh, countries which depend on one sole or almost one sole of uh, resources, which is oil and gas, and, and thus, in the long run, uh, being put policies and regulations by some countries such as EU and others, when they put their policies to reduce dependence on oil by 2050, by 50% 50 of the fossil fuel, although uh, we know that there will be a, a demand on that, on, on, fuel, on fossil fuel for, uh, for a long time. But uh, uh, even by that, uh, uh, imposing uh, 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 energy carbons and, uh, and, and carbon taxes, so that's of course affect the, our uh, resources in, in, in long term. That is what, what our worry about. Uh, and one more thing, we ask the, uh, the, the Secretariat or the, the Conference of COPs many times just to make a study what will be the, reverse ad, uh, 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 the adverse effect of Kyoto uh, Protocol and uh, the UNFCC on those countries which we, which we may use? And also, as you know, until now, the, uh, the base for uh, reducing emissions is 19, was 1990. And until now, the many, many countries, they did not uh, uh, fulfill their commitments towards that uh, target. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we're going we're gonna to end, but um, I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. But um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's fair to say that we end this discussion with more questions than answers, which I think is not at all a failure of the discussion, but uh, a sign of how complicated this issue is. And I, I dare say there's probably going to be plenty of room for another discussion about energy at the ME Days conference next year. So thank you very much. Thank Pierre. Thank Naki. Thank Carmen. Thank Ahmed. Thank you for being such an interested audience, and um, I think we all look forward to a really interesting next couple days. Bye-bye.